enough words of introduction have been given upstairs for Bill Blumo that we'll simply say, thank heaven Bill is with us today, and here he is. <laughs> but I will do my best, okay? Um, anyway, I think it's, it's really, uh, it, it, it's, it's just a, a, an enormous uh, step forward, and I was very, very moved by the, by the, uh, uh, the whole gathering this morning and the uh, appropriate choice of prayers and, and hymns and everything else uh, to, uh, to address this, this issue. So let, let me just start off with the, what, are, what are you thinking about? What am I thinking about climate change? And, uh, and try to give you some, some basic uh, background. Um, it's, as, as I said, it's become a touchstone for the faith community. And um, here at St. John's, we're in good company. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, I was invited to uh, speak at the Congregational Church in West Concord by uh, Karen Ford, whose parents live here in Williamstown. She grew up in Williamstown. It's right across the street from us. And, um, and what was interesting there, the way, the way they're doing it is, is so appropriate to Concord. Uh, a member of the congregation said, uh, you know, um, we ought to have something and we're going to call it the shout heard around the world. We must revere our climate. <laughs> and they are going to reenact Paul Revere's ride from Charlestown to the Old North Bridge with bicycles. <laughs> and so people can join all the way along the route, which runs right through Arlington, where we have, where we have been living. Uh, and, um, and and I just thought, you know, that's 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 original goal, you know, really right right on the money. Exactly what uh, what, what what works there. Um, uh, the Unitarian Universalists have uh, have actually declared the month from uh, March twenty second to April twenty sixth, uh, April twenty second, as uh, Climate Justice Month. It begins on World Water Day, or bang again on World Water Day, and it will end on Earth Day. Sort of interesting, the blending of the of the sacred and the secular here, which I thought was was, was quite uh, quite intriguing. Um, and and let me let me just try to go through uh, <coughs> a, a way of, of of thinking about this. And I think the first thing, and and, and you heard it today, uh, uh, really the the whole wonder of creation. Um, and, and the world into which we were born is obviously a marvelous place. Uh, it's so marvelous that as a species we've been able to uh, survive on this planet for some 200,000 years. That's 10,000 generations, right, have gotten us to this point. The past 11,000 years have been especially kind. The geologists call this the Holocene era. It's been what might be called the Goldilocks climate. Not too hot. Not too cold, just right. It is the period in which agriculture was invented, cities were invented, civilization, as we like to call ourselves, but you know, our whole cities and, 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 and civilization, our history is only in that period. Before that, we sort of make it up some little fragments we can find buried in old fire pits and things like that. But for that part, we actually have some kind of a record. Um, now, both science and the Bible talk, have, have, have a story of creation, and it's remarkable actually how parallel they are, and I'm not sure whether that's because the, the, obviously the biblical story came first and the science came later, and uh, whether scientists like to admit it or not, we are all influenced by the culture in which we come up, and that culture is based and begins in Genesis. Uh, and, uh, and so, um, as, you, as you all know, the story begins with the creation of light, and then heaven and earth, and um, and then all of a 
stars, the sun and the moon. On the fifth day, God created the first light, the fish and the birds. A whole day just for fish and birds. <laughs> should be rejoicing in, in these gifts. Yet we get up every morning and hardly notice. In fact, as we go through our day and as the 550 generations of the Holocene, the people who came before us, our human forebearers, as, we, as they march through the Holocene era and into what's now called the human-dominated Anthropocene era, where humans are calling the shots on the planet and how it operates. We and they laying waste to this incredible world and its gifts. And that can lead to a lot of grieving, a lot of angst, a lot of concern. Um, and, um, and, and we can, it's easy to just fall into a deep funk when you go through these. I'll go through a few of these things just to, just to get you depressed before I bring you back up. Okay? <laughs> so, um, until now, the issue of climate change has been dominated by scientists and economists. Um, I began working on climate change in 1989, and as, as Peter said, perseverance may be a virtue, but I'm not sure some days. Uh, it, 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 it's a lot. Uh, or actually, I began in 88 and, and, and continued through, um, moved from being a chemist teaching here at Williams to being a policy scientist working on climate change and other things that are changing loss of biological diversity. Our own Williamstown Elizabeth Colbert's book, The Six Extinctions, was, again, what a really depressing but well-written read. That's a good one for you. Um, uh, fisheries, the loss of fisheries. Uh, fisheries in the world peaked in 1985, our take of ocean fisheries, and it's been declining ever since. And uh, we still can't seem to get it right despite 65 fisheries treaties that we have. So we need to, we need to really uh, move this whole thing forward. When I first started in 88, we were really naive as to how difficult it would be to convince people and society and industry and corporations that this was a, an oncoming juggernaut that we had to deal with, climate change. It was just going to be enormous. And so we have, since that time, burned huge amounts of coal and oil and natural gas, put gases in the atmosphere, carbon dioxide, that are trapping heat. And believe it or not, it was only about a month ago that we actually had the first direct measurement showing that over a 10-year period, the amount of heat being trapped by the increase in carbon dioxide is almost exactly what the theoretical calculations have been saying. Now it's been measured. So this argument about models, garbage in, garbage out, you know, forget that. We have the, the, the I don't like to use the term smoking gun. I don't like that metaphor. <laughs> Uh, but uh, we, we have the evidence, uh, it's very direct. So um, I'm sure you've heard of Bill McKibben and his 350.org organization, and that refers, 350 refers to where he thinks the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere should be, 350 parts per million. That's three and a half hundredths of a percent. Sounds tiny, but in pre-industrial times it was 280. We are now at 400 on the trajectory on we're headed to 750. And we've already seen warming of about, um, about one and a half degrees Fahrenheit. And look at all the things that are happening because of that. 
really astounding. Everybody says, oh, it's just another half degree here, or whatever it's going to be. But, but the, um, uh, the, the increase in storm intensity, not in, not in the number of hurricanes, but in the intensity of hurricanes. Because hurricanes get their intensity from the ocean, the heat in the ocean, and the oceans are warming up. More heat, more intensity. The, um, the, the um, um, uh, people who work on this have, have uh, said, well, you know, we really shouldn't get more than about three and a half degrees warmer than three industrial levels. That would, you know, that's not safe, but boy, if we go beyond that, we're in really big trouble. I mean, then we're talking about Antarctic uh, melting, Greenland melting. Greenland melts, that's 21 cubic feet level rise right there. That's like putting one huge ice cube into a glass and having it just overflow. Uh, we are safe here in the Berkshires. Do not buy waterfront property. That's the, that's the message here. It is, it is not a good investment. Um, oh, okay. Is this better? Okay, thank you. Um, so, um, the climate is changing, and we all know it, and notwithstanding this past winter, which we're almost, I sort of feel like we're still in, except today looks better than we've seen in a long time. Uh, the, the, the record we've had, I mean, we all saw in Boston how, uh, on television, how we in Boston, we were down in Boston where, I mean, everything, everything stopped. The subways couldn't even run. There was so much snow. It was, it was really quite, quite remarkable. But despite that, February was the second warmest February worldwide in history. How could that be? Well, I got, I got emails from former students in Iceland and in Alaska. They said, boy, you guys are really suffering there in Boston. And I said, yeah, we are a little bit. They said, we haven't had any snow and it's hardly been below freezing. The uh, famous Iditarod uh, dog sled race had to be moved 500 miles north of Anchorage, Alaska to find enough snow to run it on. They should have come to Williamstown and gone through the back door and back and they'd have done it. It would have been a whole lot easier, I think. Anyway, um, globally, 14 of the 15 warmest years on record for the globe have, turned, have been in the 21st century. The one outlier is 1998. It, it strove to be in the 21st century, but just didn't quite make it by two years. And, uh, but nevertheless, so, so 15 of the 15 are in the last, uh, last uh, 22 years. It's just amazing. Uh, or the, the last uh, uh, 17 years. It's just amazing. How, uh, how warm it's been. Um, I see this is not a group of really young people, but <laughs> with my students, this works really well. Um, if, if anyone who is 38 years old or younger has never experienced a month in their life that was as cool as the average for that month in the 20th century. In other words, never had a, lived in a April that was cooler than the average April of the 20th century. That's pretty astounding. That's 38 years in a row of 12 months a year all being warmer than the average for the 20th century. So that just puts it in some kind of perspective. Um, uh, sea levels are rising. Uh, the storm damage we get along the coasts are just, just really quite horrendous. We saw that with uh, Superstorm Sandy, uh, with uh, storms uh, elsewhere, um, even worse. Um, the consequences for us have been severe, but the consequences for people living in Africa and in the Pacific and so forth are worse. The, um, the Philippines has been hit by major typhoons in both 2013 and 2014. Ironically, in the very week, each year, the diplomats were quarreling over whether or not we could get a treaty that would help address climate change. That's pretty astounding. In, the, in, in 2013, the head of the Philippine delegation went on a hunger strike to call attention to this. And what's interesting, it was a transformative moment because developing countries have not been required to do anything because they have to develop. Right? Only industrial countries are supposed to do something because we cause most of the problem and we have the resources to fix it and so on and so forth. But the Philippines made a commitment and said, we are going to do something and we urge all the other developing countries to do the same. And as we march towards the big conference in Paris that will happen this December, every developing country now says, okay, we're gonna do something. 
and they're supposed to have submitted their results by the end of March, which they haven't really tried, but nevertheless, before that meeting in Paris, there will be on the table, every country in the world will have a statement as to what they plan to do uh, between, between now and about the 20, uh, 2025 and 2030. That time frame, that's what they're negotiating on. That's at least a step forward, although there's still a long ways to go. I'm very confident this is gonna work because one of my former students is co-chairing the negotiation process. <laughs> he really knows what to do. He's a very seasoned diplomat and, uh, and is, uh, is, is, is really, really confident, working very closely with his partner, his co-partner in this, who is a, a very seasoned diplomat from Algeria. And the two of them have worked together for years and they have the confidence of governments around the world. Um, in March, there was a devastating storm that hit, um, uh, hit in the Pacific. Uh, the, uh, the I guess they're called typhoons in the Pacific and they're called hurricanes in the Atlantic. It's the same, same basic thing, tropical storms. And um, uh, so uh, Vanuatu was devastated by Typhoon Pam. The, the satellite photographs just show not a tree standing on some of those islands not a building standard on most of those islands. 30,000 people in the capital, just no place to go. Um, it top winds 200 miles an hour. I mean, this is what I mean about the greater intensity. This is the problem we're facing. Now, um, so that's something to be pretty upset about. Um, but I would like to say that I think now is, well, it's past time that, um, that we begin to uh, uh, bring in the ethical and moral dimensions of this issue. It's been dominated for um, uh, far too long by economists and scientists and by politicians who don't wanna do anything. And it's now time to get to the heart of this matter. And, and, and that brings me, I guess, to, to Peter's second question is, um, what, what should we pray for? Your first reaction is probably, how about deliverance? Could we have deliverance? That would be a nice thing, if, if, please God, could we have deliverance from this? Uh, for uh, forgiveness. Um, how about for inspiration? I like inspiration better than either of those. I like inspiration. Let's have inspiration for what we can do about it and how we might uh, do it. So, um, if you heard today the message about um, that, that, that the, the whole message of, of, uh, of our faith is, is, is really uh, based on, on, uh, on you know, the, two, the, the two great commandments. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and all thy soul and with all thy mind and with all thy strength. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. How can we love God and de destroy the creation? That just seems to me to be a contradiction that, that, we're, that we're struggling with. And I don't mean to imply that we've done this deliberately. We've done it accidentally. But once we know, then the rules change, right? Then, 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 then we, have to, we have to own up to it. Um, I spotted this really uh, interesting uh, uh, question on, uh, on one of the websites that I was thinking about preparing for this, and I'm just going to different uh, websites uh, from different churches and so forth, and on one of them, uh, a young woman asks, if I, am responsible for uh, if I am responsible for climate change, does that harm the natural world and my fellow human beings, if I am responsible? And I think, unfortunately, we can't get out of that. Yes, yes, we are responsible. And uh, so we need to figure out um, uh, what, uh, whether we can do something about it. And uh, so let's, Take a look and see what is what, what is it that we can do, and how do we how do we get this inspiration, this understanding, so that we can actually do it? Um, I, I doubt if many people here are aware of an organization called Interfaith Power and Light. It was originally Episcopal Power and Light, and it was founded by Steve McCausland, who was a Williams graduate from the 1980s, I guess. He was a communicant here at St. John's went on, uh, lived in the eastern part of the state, worked as a bishop there on all sorts of faith-based things connected to the environment and other things. One of the reasons that, that the, the, the diocesan lines were changed to river basins was because of Steve McCausland because water, 
representing the flow of the Holy Spirit is a way of tying things together. And he made all these interesting arguments. And, and the bishop thought for a while and said, yeah, that's a good idea. Let's do that. And this idea of Episcopal power and might was a, was a really, really fascinating, uh, fascinating innovation. The mission of interfaith power and light, I'm reading this from the, from the statement, is to be faithful stewards of creation by responding to global warming through the promotion of energy conservation, energy efficiency, and renewable energy. This campaign intends to protect the Earth's ecosystem, safeguard the health of all creation, and ensure sufficient, sustainable energy for all. That's the mission statement. The person who now heads it is the Reverend Sally Bingham. She co-founded this with Steve, and uh, she is the president of, of Interfaith Power and Light, and is now president, uh, and she's now canon for the environment in the Episcopal Diocese of California. So here is the Episcopal Church out in front. This whole thing was founded in 1998. Got the idea. Let's move it forward. And I think the problem is we haven't made enough of that. We haven't recognized that we are actually doing things and and should be uh, uh, be uh, uh, taking uh, taking the uh, uh, lead. Um, so um, I would argue that the engagement of uh, our religious institutions and and uh, uh, and and, um, and their members, all of us who are are, are part of that, uh, is essential. Um, just to, just, to, just to, let me just say something about how it's been dominated by scientists and economists. Uh, I'm one of the scientists who's been involved in this, and and uh, we have found that it took a while to kind of gather all the information that's out there and say, yep, this is really happening, and yep, it's really serious. And as you read these every six-year reports from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the first one said in 1990 said, yeah, it could be happening, right? The other one said, could be happening. Um, only one scientist, James Hansen, at uh, NASA, had said in 1988, it's here. In 10 years, the person on the street will know it. Everybody went, no, 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 10 years, no, yeah, but you can't, you can't say that. But the evidence was accumulating. And so five years later, and 11 years later, and so forth, it became stronger and stronger. So that the report that came out in 2013 basically said, with 95% certainty, we can say that climate change is happening and humans are responsible for it if that's the reality of it. 95%. Now, I know scientists will say 100% because everybody wants to be a little, just a little bit cautious on this and not, not, not uh, get caught out somewhere. Uh, but that's pretty amazing to get, to get that kind of, kind of agreement. Um, we will all be joined shortly by Pope Francis, who will be delivering an encyclical on climate change when he goes to the Philippines which is so devastated. And he's going to issue an encyclical, which is a big deal in the Catholic Church for Pope to, to, to put out an encyclical. And to devote the entire thing to climate change and, and really earth care is, uh, is pretty, pretty remarkable. And uh, I think, uh, I think it's, it's, uh, because of his high profile, I think we should all, all uh, uh, welcome that. Um, I think, um, as I think about, about uh, the, the problem we've had with focusing just on, on science and economics is that um, when the scientists said that we had to reduce our emissions by some big number, like 80% by 2050, the economists said we can't afford to do that. Right? An economist colleague of mine has written a book on the economics of climate change. The title is, Can We Afford the Future? Pretty thoughtful title, pretty thought-provoking title. If we can't afford the future, what's the point, right? I think that's a really great way to put it. So I think economists are capable of redemption, but they do the work sometimes. <laughs> so it's, uh, you just have to bring them along. Um, a colleague of mine who is a philosopher, um, <clears throat> once uh, we, had, we were having discussions about climate change, <clears throat> and. Uh, and he said, well, you know, one of the things about human beings is we are, depending on your point of view, either blessed or cursed with foresight. <laughs> if we have foresight, it means we can anticipate the consequences of our actions. And the reason that there is any such thing as ethics at all is if we see that our actions are going to harm someone, then we shouldn't do it. 
That's the ethical thing to do. And that's built into our Christian faith. It's also uh, uh, one need not even have a faith, I think, to understand that that's what works best, right? Just from a secular point of view, it just works best if we don't go around harming other people. Um, let me bring this back to something here in New England in his bestseller, Walden, Henry David Thoreau, wrote his famous passage. I went to the woods because I wished to live deliberately, to front only the essential facts of life, <clears throat> and see if I could not learn what it had to teach, and not, when I came to die, discover that I had not lived. Pretty profound. Good job, Nick. That was, that was hardly without a bumper sticker, but it's a really <laughs> profound point. Um, by going into the woods and nature more broadly, uh, we see that uh, what nature has to teach. And uh, it's teaching that we are destroying the support system on which we live. Uh, just uh, uh, about a month ago, a very disturbing uh, study came out. Uh, a group of British scientists had been going into the Amazon to take them to the woods to live deliberately and see what nature had to teach. And what they found was the Amazon is sucking up huge amounts of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. That's good. That's important. The disturbing thing is that peaked in 1995 and is now, according only one third as much as it was before, in 20 years. That's, that's terrible. That's really bad news. Um, and, and so, you know, that's, we do need to know that, though, because it means we have to figure out what to do. So, um, I mean, the good news is that, uh, that, the, that, that the world's emissions from uh, energy did not grow between 2013 and 2014, despite the fact that the gross world product, the economic growth, was 3%. First time that's ever happened. We have to bring it down by 80%, but nevertheless, stopping the growth is the first step to going down in our emissions. So um, lots of good things are happening uh, all over the world. So. Um, so I, as I say, I think the thing to pray for is inspiration for what to do rather than grieving. Let's get over the grieving and get on to doing something about it. And so what are we, what, what are we doing? Um, you know, most of us are so um, used to just you know, getting up in the morning, doing whatever we do, driving whatever we do. I drive back and forth from here to Boston. I have a really efficient car, but it, and, I, and, I, and, it, and it's partly electric, and I can charge that with my solar panels. I feel really good about that. Uh, that's, a, that's a start. Uh, uh, we, we live in a house here that is, uh, is a zero net energy house, and so we generate as much electricity as we use, and that's for our heating and our hot water and for our lights and everything. And so the first step is to say, well, what could I do there? And, uh, uh, you know, I'm sure everybody here has, has, has screwed in a new light bulb at some point, right? We, we've just gone to the second stage in our house. Um, in our kitchen, there are three reflector flood lights that normally would be 75 watts each, so that's 225 watts. When we built the house, we would use the uh, mercury um, complex fluorescents, and those were, th those, that, those were 45 watts, so that's a big drop. We've just replaced those with LED lights, which, which uh, all together uh, add up to something like uh, 28 and a half watts. We've cut that by 40% more. I mean, there, there are, the technology is improving, but we have to agree to, to, to change the way we're doing things and, uh, and do it differently. And there's so many things that are out there that we can, we can make those choices. Um, let me suggest a way to think about this that I think is appropriate, uh, which is that we're all familiar with the concept of tithing. What about a carbon tithe? is a climate tithe. What car how much carbon emissions can you give up in a year? 5%, 10%? It only takes 5% a year to get us to this goal of reducing our emissions by 80% by 2050. And we can do it in so many ways that thinking about that as our gift to creation, I think makes a lot of sense. And if you have children or grandchildren, it can be a really fun exercise. The only thing I'll warn you ahead of time is once the elementary age kids get onto this, <laughs> you are in, 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 in moral danger of anything that you do to violate what you said you were going to do. So, so be
be forewarned. Uh, but it can be a lot of fun and, and, and a real learning experience because uh, kids can learn from a very early age. I mean, why do we all recycle? Mostly because our kids were taught about it in school and came home and said, Mommy, you can't put that in there. That's going to other container. Right? We've all experienced that. So that's, that's the direction we need to go. Um, this year, Massachusetts suffered hundreds of millions of dollars of ice dam damage from people in their own homes. Those big icicles, they look picturesque, but they're a disaster for the house. And it means that you're wasting a huge amount of energy and damaging the structure. If, uh, it's hard to believe that with 400 years of building houses in New England, we still have ice dams, right? We could have figured this out a long time ago. And now we have modern materials that make it possible to never have an ice dam ever again. And, and, uh, and uh, the, the Mass Save program will come and inspect your house and tell you where you need to put in insulation and seal things and so forth. And uh, they'll be, you'll, be, you'll be shocked when you discover some things that are happening. Um, I know of cases uh, where people uh, were running uh, heating and cooling ducts through the attic, which was totally uninsulated. So the heat came from a furnace, then in the winter it was air conditioned through the attic, and then it bumped into the room. And it was all warm. I thought it was warm. In the summer, you can't get the room cool. It's all, well, the attic's 140 degrees. You know, you're running cool, cool air. You do all this work to cool the air, then you run it through the attic. And then, anyhow, it, some of it is, is painfully embarrassing when you discover it, but it's important. And, you know, be brave, be bold, and just go for it. So, um, we're getting calls all the time now to uh, switch our electric uh, supplier and so forth. I'm sure you've gotten those calls. Margaret and I checked on a couple of these places. The reason they can offer it cheaply is it's dirty, coal-powered electricity from Virginia that they want to sell us here, right? And they only guarantee the rate for three months anyway. And, you know, our friends at uh, National Grid are going to actually, after zapping us for the last several months with very much higher rates, they're going to bring those down anyway. So just be careful. I, I just, I'm not sure it's a good, it's a good thing to jump on those things at all. Um, I know many of you um, uh, try to eat lo the locally grown food, uh, maybe you're part of the caretaker farm, the CSA, or something like that. Uh, that makes a difference. Uh, our buying habits make a difference. Um, uh, and, and what you can do is there are some very good online calculators that will show you just how you just put in various kinds of things. You know, what kind of car do you have? How many miles do you drive? What was your electric bill? What was your heating bill? And you can figure out what your carbon footprint is. And then you can see where are the places that you can make the most difference. So I would say um, um, pray for the patience to do that. <laughs> and, 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 then, and then go out go out and do it. Um, let, let me just close with a, with a, with a quotation from uh, uh, Mahatma Gandhi, who was a, 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 really a disciple of Thoreau. Uh, his whole... Uh, resistance to the British was based on civil disobedience, nonviolence, uh, and, uh, and, and, and a number of other things that Thoreau uh, uh, put forth. This is from, from Mahatma Gandhi. Civilization in the real sense of the term consists not in the multiplication of our wants, but deliberate and voluntary restriction of wants. Even the laws of diminishing utility and the law of insatiable wants clearly indicate that the more a man has, the less he's able to derive pleasure from the articles of consumption. <clears throat> well, Gandhi was also an outspoken advocate for the poor, and that we really need, and it is the poor who are suffering the most on climate change. So if we really, really do believe that one of our missions uh, is to, uh, is uh, at the very least not to harm the poor, and hopefully to help them, anything that we can do will help us uh, meet that goal. So each of us can make a difference in addressing climate change and decrease our pressure on the planet and its people. And I can tell you from all the years that uh, Margaret and I have been working on making our houses more, our house more efficient and doing all these kinds of things, that there is great satisfaction that comes from um, meeting our true needs with a minimum adverse consequence <coughs> for the climate system and the environment in general. And so I would just like to <coughs> close by saying, I hope you will all join in.
figure out what it is we can do, and then go out and do it, and bring as many other people along with you as you can. Thank you. Do your light bulbs in the kitchen down to whatever bulbs can see? I mean, I'm wondering. Oh, yes. <laughs> oh, it's the same, this is the interesting thing. It's so exactly the same amount of light. See, the, see the, well, what you want is light. You don't want light. What? It's brighter than it's the actually, CFL. Yeah, it's actually brighter than what's <laughs> in the place. <laughs> uh, you can get them at Home Depot. I think you can get some of them at Walmart. What are they called? Uh, they, they're, they're LED. Okay. LED. Light emitting diode, but LED, it'll say on the box. <laughs> and it'll say something like. Uh, uh, 75 watt equivalent. That's if it were the old, you know, Edison light bulb. Mm -hmm. And now it puts out as much light as that bulb, but it was only using 10 watts instead of 75. So it's an amazing, amazing thing. There, there are some further yep. things they need to know. They often come in um, daylight, cool light, and warm light. The warm light is the closer to the yellow light that you used to with incandescent. So be careful about choosing those light bulbs. It's sometimes they get all mixed up at Home Depot to make sure that each one you pick. The other thing to know is that they have, until now, LED lights could not be put in enclosed fixtures. Um, they have just, Cree has just come out with a light bulb, a 60 watt equivalent that is about 9.5 watts that can be put in an enclosed fixture. So if you have an enclosed ceiling fixture or something like that, you want to be careful to read on the back that it can be put in an enclosed fixture. Yeah. And most of them say don't mix them with another kind of bulb. So if you have a fixture that holds two bulbs, don't put an incandescent on one side and the LED on the other side, or a CFL on one side and the LED, just change both of them. Uh, the price has really come down. At the time we built our house, it wasn't ready, that was only seven years ago. It wasn't ready, um, uh, it, the LEDs were just used for things like exit lights, things that were on all the time. The quality has gotten much better. At that time they cost $60 a light bulb. Now you can buy them for five to $10 a light bulb. They will last longer than we will. Yeah. It says 28 <laughs> years on the back. Yeah. <laughs> you know, put, put, put it in your will for your grandchildren. <laughs> <laughs> nice nice uh, intergenerational transfer of, uh, of a benefit. <laughs> so do you recommend the yellow, the ones that say yellow? Yes, yeah, the ones for, that are the ones that for are for residential are, use. Yes. Yes. Yeah. I mean, if you're trying to show off a, uh, if you're at a, if you're at a jewelry store, and want to show off the glitter of the diamonds, you know, use the use the, use the light bulb. But if you're not doing that, it's just in your home. Yeah. The, the actually, lower temperature. You can see better in daylight. So for something like a shop where you don't care that it has kind of a bluish cast, the daylight might be the best thing yeah. to do. But for if you're doing any fine fine work, that might be a better choice. But or the quilt or scarf or the other thing, get the bright light. Yes, that's right. That's right. Because the yellow light won't necessarily. Good point. The light daylight. Yeah. The daylight. The daylight is better for past work. Yes, right. that's right. Mm -hmm. Yes. Can you talk about mechanical equipment back in the day? Is that still China? Yes. In fact, China. This is really fascinating. You know, China and the and the U.S. just negotiated an agreement uh, where the U.S. Uh, uh, said that, uh, that we would cut our emissions by 26 to 28 percent by 2025 because of uh, President Obama's clean power plant rule and the, and the incredible, by the way, you know, by, by 2025, uh, the average car in this country is supposed to get 52 miles per gallon. Right? Remember in 19, in 19, at the time of the first oil shocks, we were getting 13 miles per gallon on average. This is a big improvement. And, and the Chinese said, well, okay, we're still a developing country. We still have to have more energy. We're going to burn more coal. But we promise that we will, we will uh, peak no later than 2030. Well, guess what happened? Between 2013 and 2014, China's emissions went down by 2%. Now, I, I suspect it will bounce up and down. But, but you know, it's a rather dramatic uh, thing. What, what it says is both the U.S. and China basically said they would commit to do things in the future that they're already committed to and doing right now. 
And and that's that's sort of the direction that things are going. And that's that's a lot better than saying, oh, you got to perform a miracle. Some you know sometimes somewhere between now and 2025, a miracle occurs. Well, it, it could happen, I guess, but it's not likely to happen. So the fact that we're really already doing it is 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 good in itself. Well, the fact that they have all those names and confirmations in those does that. Yes, of course. The, the Chinese claim that <coughs> that uh, 400 uh, because of their what we consider excessively rigid population control policies, they avoided 400 million births. And if those 400 million people had been born, their emissions would be I don't know what the number is, but even more. And when I talk to colleagues in China, they say, well, even though they're talking about relaxing that rule, culturally. No one in China is planning to have more than one or two children. It's culturally become the norm, which is pretty interesting. So, yes, others. Yes. Uh, I feel like I hear language out there between there. We have to give stuff up. We, we, yes. we you know, not. Yeah, we have to give stuff up. <laughs> deprivation. And then there's the sort of economist side of we need to let the market solve this. There right. will be. We will find market-driven solutions, so we can continue to have progress and growth and all that. It will just be, where do you, how, how do you balance yeah. those? Well, I mean, I mean suppo deal? suppose this were 1915 instead of 2050, where would we be? Right? If, if, if uh, um, I don't know, what would the St. Patrick's Day Parade in New York have looked like in 1915? Not many, not many cars. Horses and buggies, <laughs> yeah, I, and 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 not only you know barely telephones, certainly not iPhones and fancy things like that. Um, in, in, in I know that for the year 1903, um, Henry Ford was making 14 cars a day, and uh, three percent of U.S. households had electric lights. Everybody else was using either town gas or the wealthy were using whale oil lamps because it burned so cleanly. So Thomas Edison saved whales by inventing the electric light bulb. <laughs> Little known fact and an important one. Uh, and and look at the transformation. You know, between between say you know early 1900s until the mid century, how many people were still driving horses and buggies in the United States? Right, the Amish, fine, that's their privilege. But almost to the, we, we had we had automobile suburbs by then, and we'd had two world wars and a Great Depression in the middle of it, and we still made that kind of transformation. So it seems to me that we're in that kind of a situation right now. We are shutting down coal burning power plants in this country very rapidly, and the newspaper keeps telling you that it's being replaced with natural gas. Yeah, about a third of it's being replaced with natural gas. The rest is wind power and solar power and geothermal power and hydropower, all renewables. It is, it is, we, we are in the midst of a transformation. And then you add to that super efficient light bulbs where you don't need as much power in the first place, and super efficient uh, refrigerators and all these other things, all of a sudden, it's a totally different situation. So I'm, I'm optimistic. I think the market will play a major role, but policy play a major role as well. <coughs> right? If you, if we keep, and, and there's a big push on right now to block people from having solar panels on their roof, even in Massachusetts. The, uh, it's pressed by, by a group called ALEC, and the, and the rule would be if you have solar panels on your roof and you want to send it out to the grid every once in a while when you have too much, you, you have to send it all out at wholesale prices and buy it back at retail prices. You cannot use it internally. Well, it's a, it's a law in several states now, and it was an attempt to get it here, and right now they're trying to get it in New Hampshire. And uh, so, you know, these are things we have to be alert to. We can't just sit back and say, oh, well, okay, fine, let, let those, I don't believe in politicians anyway, so let them do what they're doing, but it could be really damaging. Uh, they want to bring in that huge gas pipeline, which you've probably heard a lot about, Kendall Morgan's pipeline through here. Um, and isn't it curious that, uh, that, uh, 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 that uh, National Grid and, uh, and, uh, Eversource now it's called in the eastern part of the state, pulled out of their 75% agreement to, to buy 75% of the power from Cape Wind, and then suddenly we have to have this gas pipeline. You think there's a connection here? No, I, just, I just wonder about that. Uh, so we have to be, uh, okay, I'm not supposed to advocate 
we can look at all these politically type of things, but we, we, we ignore what's happening politically at our own peril. And, uh, and, and you know, you make up your own mind what you want to support and not support, but, but pretending that it's all just going to happen, that the magic of the marketplace all by itself is not true. Not when they change the rules and stack things against. The statement was that some people say that uh, all this climate change is uh, a lot of it's caused by natural causes. And we know that the climate does change over time naturally. But most of that change occurs about every 100,000 years. This has happened in less than 100 years, the changes we're seeing now. In fact, it's happened in 50 years, and it's happened exactly when we put all these things in the atmosphere. And we now have direct measurements showing that that has indeed gone things up. It was warmer in 800, you know, and then it got cold again. Well, it's been, actually, it has been getting cooler all the way, if you look at the slope, all the way until about 1900. The world was cool. Yeah. And then it's jumped up just dramatically here. So we have overwhelmed the natural cooling process that we underwent. So it's not anything that nature is doing to try to, to, try to warm things up. It's, it was, nature was heading the other direction. But, but it, it is, uh, it's an interaction between what happens naturally in the world and what we do to change it. And we're biasing the whole thing in an upward temperature direction. Yes, Tim. Did you have a point of no return? How close are we? Yeah, oh, that's a really, you really want to depress people, don't you? <laughs> yeah, tipping points, uh, points of no return. Uh, we may have hit one already, which is uh, uh, in, in West Antarctica, there's a whole big piece of the ice shelf which is sitting on top of a ledge and it appears to have come uncoupled from that. As it falls into the ocean, that will add a little bit to the sea level rise, but it will, uh, it will turn loose this whole set of glaciers. And the estimate that was made uh, earlier this year is uh, probably four feet of sea level rise is likely in this ice, just from that alone. So that's, and that, that would occur, I don't know, within decades to a century. Maybe the final number is 150 years out. I don't know. No, nobody knows for sure. But that's huge. We, we're dumping 16 cubic miles of ice into the, uh, melting it into the North Atlantic and Greenland every year. That's raising sea level. Sea level's rising two and a half times as fast. Oh. We're cooling the ocean around Greenland. We're cooling the ocean around Antarctica. But we're warming it every place else because we're, you know, we're dumping ice cubes into it there. And so that's a, that's a change. And making the water fresher, you know, it, uh, diluting the salt. And that allows it to, um, uh, well, and, and, that, and that, that's changing everything for everything that lives there. That's a huge a secondary effect that's happening. So, so I'm sorry to be so, you know, di <laughs> the dismal. Well, which is the dismal science? Economics is part of it, I guess, is one of the dismal sciences. Is that right, John? <laughs> but, uh, but climate science is another dismal science because uh, it seems as though uh, things don't, uh, don't uh, always go the way we would hope for or pray for. And um, I don't think we can just pray for it and hope it'll happen. I think we have to pray for it and then do something about it. That would be my, my message. Anyone else? Yeah, yes, sir. Um, I, I'm wondering if you see anything to be optimistic about on the international political scene. I know yes. you know more about it than most of us here do, yeah. and, and that's <coughs> always so discouraging to me. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, here's what's interesting. The, the, the European Union has committed to a 40% reduction by 2030, and some countries in Europe want to go higher than that in terms of their emissions. That's, that's, that's huge. I mean, they're already on, par, on track to meet that. They, 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 uh, I mean, Germany is now getting almost 30% of its total energy from, from wind and solar primarily. Denmark is getting uh, almost 40% of its electricity from wind alone. Um, Norway is 100% from hydropower. Um, Uruguay, yeah, you know, Uruguay, the big powerful nation down in South America somewhere, tucked in there by, by Argentina, is now 100% renewable energy. 
So it's, it's happening in uh, Costa Rica, is the largest geothermal company. Uh, so there, there are a lot of countries that are doing a lot. And I'm, that, that's what makes me optimistic because it's demonstrating that it can be done. I think that's maybe the best part of it. it it's not something that's science fiction or, or vain hopes. It's, uh, it's something that can be achieved. Yes? is committed to an 80% reduction by 2050. Uh, the, this anti-group tried to get a, um, a uh, initiated a referendum, and uh, uh, that it was the referendum to, to not do this was defeated by it was 62% of the vote. All of the high-tech companies out there came out and said, look, this is the future. If you want to be in the future, go with us. If you want to be with the past, go with the coal industry. And it just, it just sailed right through. I'm going to play the role of Father Time here, <laughs> and uh, perhaps some of you might like to linger as we talk more with Bill. But um, before we express our thanks to Bill, I want to put in a plug for the next uh, installment of this series, which is not next Sunday, but the week after that, 26th, when we will have Ra Rabbi Rachel Barenblatt and uh, Chaplain Rick Spaulding as science and policy has come to us today in the person of Bill Dumla. Um, they will be bringing yet different approaches to the questions, the same questions that Bill has addressed today so well. Thank you. Thank you.